Since the fall of Muammar Gaddafi, Libya has seen one problem after another. The North African nation has been split along tribal, territorial and partisan lines with two governments and multiple militias vying for power. And with thousands of Africans attempting to cross the Mediterranean for Europe each day, Libya literally finds itself in the middle of not one crisis but two and they are beginning to overlap. So how exactly is the political instability contributing to Europe's migrant influx and what will it take to bring peace back to Libya after years of crisis? I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Now, four years after Libyan strongman Muammar Gaddafi was toppled by a Western-backed revolution, the North African country is still struggling to regain some semblance of stability. Now, this is where it all began in February 2011, Benghazi. Violent protests broke out in this eastern Libyan city. The riots quickly spread. The UN Security Council responded by imposing a no-fly zone over Libya and ordering airstrikes, ostensibly to protect civilians. And that was in March. British, French and US military aircraft participated in the devastating airstrikes. Now, slightly under six months after the revolution began, Gaddafi found himself outgunned and forces loyal to him outnumbered. He went into hiding. That was in August. A rather brutal and violent end awaited Muammar Gaddafi. On October the 20th, he was captured and killed by rebels. But Libya's real problems, it would appear, had just begun. Beyond removing Muammar Gaddafi from power, the revolution's goal remained elusive. And as you can see on this graph on the Mediterranean Sea, it is still witnessing an unprecedented refugee crisis. Some have described it as a symmetry, and Libyans are among hundreds of those dying to trying to cross into Europe. So how exactly can Libya be fixed? In the meantime, though, last week, Saturday, Italy's Coast Guard successfully coordinated the rescue of around 3,000 migrants in the Mediterranean Sea. And this is after receiving distress calls for more than 20 overcrowded vessels drifting in waters off Libya. It is perhaps the biggest rescue mission that has been conducted since the migrant crisis began. Though most of the rescued migrants seemed traumatized by the experience, the single-day operation was concluded with no reports of casualties. Two Navy ships, the Sigala Fulgosi and the Vega, picked up respectively 507 and 432 migrants from two wooden boats in danger of sinking just off Libya. The Coast Guard said its patrol boats had boarded a total of just under 1,000 people from various unseaworthy fishing boats and inflatables that had left Libya on Friday night. At least another 1,000 rescued migrants and refugees were reported to be headed for Italian ports on other boats. This new wave of arrivals has triggered concern over how Italy's Prime Minister Matteo Renzi is handling the migrant crisis. Just over 170,000 migrants and refugees from Africa, the Middle East and South Asia landed at Italy's southern ports in 2014 after being rescued in the Mediterranean. The total of 2015, however, has already reached 104,000. A further 135,000 plus have landed in Greece since January and more than 2,300 people have died at sea while trying to make it to Europe with the help of traffickers. Recently, Italy arrested traffickers in connection to the death of 49 migrants. Most migrants say that they pay up to 2,000 US dollars for traffickers to take them across the Mediterranean. The number of migrants willing to make the crossing appears to be increasing despite the imminent and almost certain dangers. Catherine Ogunde, CCTV. We're going to broaden this discussion now and to help us do that, I have expert guests standing by in Geneva, Itai Biriri, he's the media and communications officer at the International Organization for Migration. In Cairo, Dr. Ziad Akul, he's a senior researcher at the Al-Ahram Center for Strategic and Political Studies. Thank you both for joining in the conversation. Uh, Dr. Ziad Akul, to you first in Cairo, though, just give us an overview here now because since the overthrow of Muammar Gaddafi, Libya has descended into chaos practically. I mean, there are two governments there. ISIL is now involved. There are militias all over the place. What exactly is going on? 
Well, what is going on really is, is a very common post-revolutionary or post-regime change phase in Libya, specifically that the pattern of revolution that, that the Libyan revolution took was not exactly uh, conducive of a sovereign authority. So what we're seeing now is a state of multiple authority, that there is basically no one single unified government capable of establishing sovereignty over the whole territory of Libya, and therefore we keep having weak governments that topple each other and follow each other. And finally, starting from 2014, we have had two separate entities, one in Tobruk, one in Tripoli, and both of them really lack actual sovereignty on the ground, and both of them have very huge divisions inside each of, of the entities, and there seems to be no agreement between the two sides so far, although the UN has been doing its best to actually reach a coalition government, but the amount of division and fragmentation inside right. each of the camps keeps on uh, expanding every, every, every single day. Well, that, that's the question that needs to be asked now because it does seem that the political parties there or the political powers and the politicians do not really have much say uh, at the moment. The government is in shambles. There's high unemployment, insecurity. At this point, one has, has to ask, though, where is Libya headed? This is, this is a difficult question to answer because according to what's given, Libya is, is, is heading to a further state of, of instability and to perhaps a more uh, profound uh, phase of division. But should there be a coalition government, if somehow an agreement is reached between the two warring parties inside of Libya and some kind of a form of empowerment is given to this agreement by actual forces on the ground, by, and, I, and I don't mean necessarily military forces, but I mean different measures that are given to the Libyan economy and the Libyan security apparatus, it could stop this, this, this case of division. So it's not simply signing an agreement. It is actually finding the measures to empower this agreement. If this does not happen, then Libya will simply head to a more contentious and a more troublesome trajectory in, 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 in the near future. Well, Itai Viriri in Geneva, though, another dimension has been added to this whole Libyan crisis. And that whole question of uh, migrants, though, and, and refugees, it's really epitomizing the Libyan crisis here. Just do paint for us a picture here, though, uh, the new twist of the refugees coming through Libya onto the Mediterranean Sea in their search uh, for greener pastures in Europe. What is the magnitude of that? Well, the numbers are quite staggering in that we are seeing, because of this vacuum, uh, Libya now being used as a transit uh, point for, for people trying to make it to Europe. And the, 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 the lack of uh, an authority there, uh, as it was before, maybe during, during Gaddafi's time, was that uh, we didn't see these kind of numbers of people trying to, to, to make this journey. The difficulty that we're also facing, apart from the sheer scale of the numbers, is how the people who are trying to migrate through the country uh, are being treated by the various militias. As you can imagine now, uh, trafficking in humans, uh, whether you want to call it smuggling, is actually quite lucrative. So it's now being used as a way of um, raising funds for some of these uh, disparate militias that you're seeing in Libya. Hence the need for, 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 for resolution of this um, uh, current crisis there. Just to give you a, a quick snapshot, I mean, so far this year, uh, just over 2,300 people have died, mostly those who have uh, left Libya trying to get to Italy or Greece. At the same time, last year, we're talking of a number of just maybe uh, just over 1,000. So you can see it's more than doubled because of the frequency, the high frequency of people trying to make this journey. All right. Well, you're talking about large numbers of people there dying and so forth. How much of that migration, though, through Libya is Libya's responsibility? Is there anything that can be done inside Libya? Well, if there was a, a, a coherent government in place, uh, as it was before, we will find the situation of less people trying to transit through Libya. Previously, people who tried to make this journey would have gone through from various other locations along the North African coast. But even then, uh, the numbers, say, going back a few years, were not as high as they are now, or even the number of uh, people losing their lives uh, were certainly nowhere near what we're seeing now. Uh, right now, I think, yesterday, I think we issued a statistic saying that at least uh, 1,000 uh, people per day are arriving uh, in either Greece or, or, or Italy. 
which is quite a, a mind-boggling figure to, to, think, to think of. And that can only uh, be stemmed, first of all, if the international community uh, resolves the situation in Libya, but also at a, at a much, much higher level if the issue of smuggling of human beings is also tackled very, very forcefully. I mean, the same way that the international community came together to tackle the issue of piracy of the East uh, African coast, the same resolve should be shown in dealing with the smuggling gangs, uh, basically criminal gangs who are profiting from human misery. All right, uh, Dr. Ziadak, you're watching this, of course, and uh, you're watching it closely from the Arab League perspective and the international community perspective. And uh, Itai Beriri there is talking about how uh, the international community should come in. Do you think the international community is doing enough to stem the problems, the challenges inside Libya, whether it is the migrant crisis, whether it is the insecurity, the governance? Well, I think that the international community is actually starting to, to become more alarmed than it used to be. The intervention that happened in Libya back in 2011 was not exactly um, well thought of, and it did not have any exit strategy. And that is why questions of further interventions in Libya have been very um, trodden carefully, carefully on. And, and that's basically why the international community has been kind of reluctant over the situation in Libya so far. And the nature of the political contention right now is actually making it more reluctant because any kind of intervention will actually have to put uh, one of the parties in favor and, and put it in advantage over the other one, which would simply lead to further problems. So the international community has, yes, has been reluctant, but recently what, what with, with the recurring uh, threatening of, of international interests like the Libyan oil production, or or the immigration, the illegal immigration to southeast, uh, to southwest Europe, um, has started to become more of an issue recently. And then there was this was coupled by some kind of an Arab joint uh, move towards discussing the intervention in Libya, which is usually some kind of an umbrella for an international action inside of of of, of the country. So. If, if we were to try and, and evaluate the performance of the international community, I would say that we are now on the steps of, of some kind of an intervention, not necessarily military, but pro possibly through further political pressure internationally. And this, has, this should have been in action about a year ago. This should have been with this intensity as soon as a state of multiple right. sovereignty started to occur. But what we're witnessing now is actually starting to happen but very late all right itai Briri, is that your uh, perception as well that uh, the international community is somewhat reluctant to uh, intervene in in the libyan situation be it particularly in that migrant situation absolutely i mean i agree with dr ziad on that on that aspect i mean the difficulty that the european union for example faces is who do they engage with in terms of uh, dealing with the migration situation, which is obviously uh, they're mostly focusing their attention on at the moment. I mean, there, there is the, the, the internationally recognized uh, government, I suppose the one in Tobruk, but it, even then, when it, um, the European Union suggested uh, sending some border uh, or migration authorities to try and stem the flow of migrants passing through Libya, I think one of the officials from, from, from that uh, internationally recognized government actually shot down the idea very, very quickly and basically warned um, uh, the EU you know, from interfering in the country. The same applied to the whole issue of how people who find themselves in distress uh, at sea uh, could be rescued by European uh, navies. And that certainly has been happening without much cooperation from the uh, Libyan authorities in terms of the navy rescues. but. Ultimately, some, some solution has to be reached. Otherwise, we will continue to see people being launched uh, from the Libyan shores in this very flimsy uh, and unseaworthy vessels and unfortunately losing their lives. I mean, as you know, right. in April, we saw that uh, the worst disaster that we have seen in the Mediterranean for many years when 850 people died. So we want to avoid those kind of scenarios in the future. I just want to take you back, though, uh, Itai, because uh, we keep hearing that a lot of the migrants are actually from sub-Saharan Africa. And if you can just give us a, a very brief uh, look here, where exactly are the majority uh, of the people emanating from? And, you know, what is fueling their exodus? 
Well, as of today, I can say we have the majority coming from countries like Eritrea, uh, Senegal, the Gambia. Uh, Syria, obviously, is one of the, the, the main uh, countries of origin. But we're looking mostly at, at, at countries like Eritrea. And really, we're looking at situations where the people are fleeing from conflict. So obviously, Syria, even Yemen, uh, Libya itself. And then in countries like Eritrea, the issue of um, people fleeing what they what they see as um, uh, human rights abuses or just not feeling that they, they have a future there. So it's a combination of what we call um, mixed mixed right. migration flaws. So a combination of refugees and people who are seeking a better life, but because of poverty. All right. Uh, a final one, though, to you, uh, Dr. Ziad Akul there, because we're going to take a break uh, shortly, though. Is there anything Libya can do to stem that tide of migration? Well, of course, there are definitely measures of border security that could be taken, but the problem is that both entities, whether in Tobruk or in Tripoli, really don't have a lot of control over their military arms. I mean, the, 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 the political offices of these governments are not in complete control of the actions of the military arms. So this measure, it should be taken, and it should be taken rapidly, but it's, it, the, the manner of its implementation is not completely there. The other thing is that regional uh, neighbors of, of Libya should definitely start paying more attention to the um, issue of, of illegal immigration because so far what has been um, put into pri the highest priority was basically border security, not really giving enough attention to the issue of refugees flowing in from Chad, Sudan, Niger, and through Egypt as well. So countries like Egypt, like Algeria, Tunisia, need to actually have a role in securing Libyan borders and, and Libyan coasts. And this will, the, the, the introduction of these um, measures through Arab countries will be a lot more easier to do and to implement than through international forces. All right, and we're going to hear more about the regional and international efforts to stabilize uh, Libya, if at all there are any ongoing. But uh, thank you to Itai Bariri for joining this discussion from Geneva. We'll hear more from Dr. Ziad Akul after the break. When we come back, we'll continue to unpack the Libyan crisis. Stay with us. We said we are fighting terrorism on behalf of the world, not only on behalf of the Arabs, not only on behalf of Libya. The enemy is a common enemy. Terrorism is the foe of the entire globe. Those who come to Libya are not Muslims, Jews or Christians. There is no heavenly religion that dictates what these groups have been doing. Well, that was Libyan Armed Forces Commander Khalifa Haftar appealing for assistance to help battle extremists in the country. Welcome back to Talk Africa. We continue our discussion now and still with us in Cairo, Dr. Ziad Akel. He's a senior researcher at the Al-Akram Center for Political and Strategic Studies. And to give us the international perspective, we're also joined from Beijing by current affairs commentator Victor Gao. Thank you both for joining in the conversation. Victor, to you first in Beijing. though The United States has sort of been quick to react to the ISIL threat in other parts uh, of the world. But in Libya, though, U.S. policy to deal with the Libyan crisis, to deal with the, the ISIL threat there in Libya seems to be somewhat non-existent. Why is that? What's going on? Well, first of all, I think we need to recognize that the current tragic situation in Libya, resulting in thousands of people fleeing the country and risking their lives upon open sea trying to reach the European shore, is a direct result of the American uh, military actions against Libya. So this is very unfortunate. The situation in Libya is not improving. It's actually deteriorating. And uh, we need to uh, draw a lesson from the use of force uh, against Libya to start with. Secondly, I think while many refugees are political refugees, there are also many people who flee 
uh, because of economic considerations. And the current way to deal with the refugees or the migrants uh, upon the open sea is not sustainable. I think it will be too much of a toll to European countries. It will be too much of a sacrifice of lives upon the open sea by those who seek better lives in Europe. So I would say that a better way to deal with this situation need to be created and consensus in the international community need to be reached so there can be a better way to build up capacity in Libya and in several other North African countries to prevent more people trying to leave Africa to flee into Europe. All right, uh, Dr. Ziad, is that the thinking now, though, that uh, much of the crisis uh, that Libya finds itself in at the moment is as, is as a result of that policy that was taken by uh, NATO allies and the United States uh, intervening militarily without having a proper exit strategy? Well, it, 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 it seems right now, I, I, I believe, that there is still some kind of debate over whether the intervention is going to be solely Arab or in, in a, some form of a joint international coalition. Um, there, there, there seems to be, so far, some kind of um, heavy debate between different Arab uh, actors within this. You have Egypt and the Emirates, for example, wanting to intervene in Libya very much due to their own interests and due to their military capabilities that they have tested in Libya before. And this will be backed by Saudi Arabia as well. On the other hand, you have important actors like Algeria, for example, which is a neighboring country of Libya and the second most powerful army in the Arab world, not wanting actually to have any kind of military intervention inside of Libya. And I believe that the international community will remain kind of reluctant until the um, different Arab nations have some kind of consensus over the pattern of intervention that, that, that is going to be um, in, induced in, 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 into Libya, and that includes the United States as well. Well, uh, Dr. Zia Dakul, though, just to go back to that point, though, did the West get it wrong in their intervention in 2011? Well, in 2011, the, the, the whole context was different. But on the other hand, you also had um, a, some, some kind of an unstable environment in the Arab world in general, specifically in, 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 right. in Northern Africa. You had regime change in Egypt, regime change in Tunisia, and the intervention in Libya, I believe, was more responsive than it was than, than really built on any kind of strategy. It was simply to stop Muammar al-Gaddafi, not to ensure ongoing stability in Libya. And if we are going to contemplate a new uh, intervention in Libya at the moment, we, we have to make sure that it's not simply something that is moved or encouraged by the growing IS threat inside of Libya, that it's right. not that we are scared of a new uh, uh, Daesh hub inside in, in, in North Africa, and that's why we will intervene. And I will put that question, though, to Victor Gao as well, though. Victor, uh, did, did the West get it wrong in that intervention in 2011, or, as uh, Dr. Ziad Akul says, the situation was vastly different? Well, I would say now that we have the benefit of the hindsight, the intervention in 2011 definitely was wrong, uh, partially because the actors involved way overseeded what the United Nations resolution allowed them to do, and eventually in you know, a war and conflict was brought into Libya, destroying whatever that remained of the regime over there, resulting in great chaos and division of the country. And I think once you destroy stability, or peace uh, in any country uh, in Africa or in the Middle East, what results will be chaos. And uh, then the collateral damage will actually spin over from that particular country into neighboring countries or even beyond the sea into Europe. So I would say that going forward, any country which wants to pull the trigger on any other country need to pause and reflect on the wisdom of that kind of action and uh, a refrain from taking any uh, hasty actions uh, before thinking twice about the consequences. I think Europe now suffers from the influx of refugees and migrants Ill illegally uh, from uh, North Africa into Europe. And this is very messy. And I think, you know, we need to philosophically come up with the conclusion 
that the intervention back in 2011 was misplaced and the consequences that Europe and other African countries are suffering are directly related to the wrongness of the intervention back in 2011. Another rather controversial uh, point here before we leave this discussion now, for an outsider, the situation inside uh, Libya is quite difficult to fathom because uh, under Muammar Gaddafi, free education, health care and housing were all provided. Libya's per capita income had risen to more than 11,000 US dollars, the fifth highest in Africa. So the question is now, for the ordinary citizen, is Libya worse off or better off than under Muammar Gaddafi? Well, it's not, it's not that simple because, yes, there were, the figures say that there was a high GDP and there was free education and free health care, but actually the fact on the ground says that yeah. this GDP was not well distributed, that this health care was very poor quality, that this education was very low quality education. Libya is not better or worse. Libya remains to be in a transitional phase that is not yet over. So we cannot judge whether it's better or worse at the moment. I mean, of course, there was more stability under Muammar al-Gaddafi because it was a 42-year-old regime. But right now, the, the, the question is, where is Libya heading, to better or to worse? Um, there is a building process because Muammar al-Gaddafi left Libya without a real state structure. All right. And building that structure will require some time and a lot of effort. Uh, Victor, your final comment on this. Is the ordinary Libyan better or worse off today than under Muammar Gaddafi? Well, uh, from the Chinese perspective, I would say that we believe the situation in Libya today is worse off by a big margin compared with the situation under Colonel Gaddafi. This does not mean that I support Colonel Gaddafi by no means. But I would say if you really want to solve the problem under Colonel Gaddafi, there might be better ways to achieve that goal without destroying the stability in Libya, without throwing people to the walls of wars and conflicts and division of the country, to chaos and uh, a great instability in the country. There must be better ways to that. I would say as a rule of thumb, to use force to destroy stability in any other country is probably the worst option going forward. There must be smarter ways, wiser ways to deal with that problem under Colonel Gaddafi while preserving the stability and the peace in that country. I would right. say people in Libya now are suffering from the use of force against Libya in 2011. And that mistake should not be repeated again to any other country in the world. All right, uh, to you both. That's all we have time for uh, this week. And thank you to my guests for joining in the discussion in Cairo, Dr. Ziad Akul. He's a senior researcher at the al Ahram Center for Political and Strategic Studies. And in Beijing, current affairs commentator Victor Gao. And to you all, I remember you can join in the conversation at the end of this program online through Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. Do join us again next week for another edition of Talk Africa. For me, Beatrice Marshall. Goodbye.